Right. Okay, well, let's uh, move on here, and we'll start the next topic, which is uh, the biceps tendon. Uh, so you're all very familiar with the biceps tendon. The long head comes up through the intertuberous groove where the transverse ligament kind of holds it in place, goes over the head into the joint space, and uh, attaches primarily in the superior tubercle of the glenoid, but has little rootlets that attach anteriorly and posteriorly as well. Uh, in this area, okay. Uh, you, you can see it on multiple sequences. Uh, it attaches here uh, to the superior part of the uh, glenoid, uh, just above the superior labrum. Uh, on many images, you can see a little cleft between the biceps tendon and the superior labrum. Occasionally, you can't separate the two, uh, but usually there's a little cleft there on, on MR examination and we look for a nice black tendon attaching to, to the bone superiorly here. This is the next cut more anteriorly. How well you see the rest of the tendon on the coronal images simply depends upon the positioning of the shoulder. Um, uh, Dr. John, excuse me, uh, does it make any difference how deep that cleft is? Uh, no, I think it's very variable, and uh, I don't think just how depth deep it is uh, makes much of a difference. We'll talk about what pathology looks like a little bit later. Okay. okay. Uh, and then if, you, if the humerus is well externally rotated, then that will bring the intraarticular biceps into the coronal plane, and you can follow it all the way to the intertuberous groove. Most people are very uncomfortable in that position, and if you force them in that position, they'll move a lot. So most people have some degree of internal rotation of the humerus. So we like it as externally rotated as a patient is comfortable doing. So we normally will only see the proximal biceps here on a couple of coronal images. Uh, this one is one that had uh, kind of extreme external rotation. And that's why the sling is comfortable. Yeah, right. It holds, holds it in a more comfortable position. In the sagittal plane, what we see here, here is the humeral head. This is the glenoid. Here's the labrum we see coming around here. And this is the superior part of the glenoid, the superior labrum. And this is the biceps attachment up through here, the coco uh, uh, chromial ligament uh, actually comes very close to this area, which we can see here. And then there's the biceps coming down. This is the rotator cuff interval fat, which I think we've already talked about, right? Okay. Uh, coming down here, but sometimes you can get scarring in here. Well, this scarring can attach to the biceps, and that can be a source of pain in patients who have adhesive capsulitis or frozen shoulder. So that's the next cutout. There's the biceps here. And then you can often follow the biceps on the sagittal images farther out here intraarticularly. This is one that had external rotation. Uh, and then you can see it extending, start extending down into the intertuberous groove. The axial images, we can also see it. Here's a nice view of the biceps tendon in the intertuberous groove, lesser tuberosity, greater tuberosity, hence the intertuberous groove. The transverse ligament is here. It's very thin. It's actually extensions of the superficial uh, anterior fibers of the subscapularis tendon, uh, which uh, the tendon attaches here to loose lesser tuberosity. The superficial fibers extend across the intertuberous groove to be the transverse ligament where they attach here to the greater tuberosity, and that helps stabilize the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, biceps tendon there. So looking at it now. John? Yes. It also has a connection with the supraspinatus uh, tendon um, and that, that the subscapularis. One is more on top, and the other one is more on the bottom of the biceps tendon. Uh, it's it, it's a new anatomy that I learned in the, in the new Campbell's. Yeah, that that's further up. That's higher up. Uh, yeah. We'll talk about the sling in a minute. That would be up where the sling mechanism is. Good. Right. Okay. Uh, Jennifer, what do you think about this anatomy? There's some cortical depression along the anterior humeral head, and I don't see a normal biceps tendon. 
a coracoid depression? Corti cortical depression. Oh, cortical. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. Here I can see the subscapularis tendon and the infraspinatus. Um, uh, this is a, a patient that does not have a well-defined uh, intertuberous groove, and that's because the patient had congenital absence of the long head of the bicep tendon, and you need that tendon in place uh, intrauterinally to, to create a, a bicepital groove. Pretty rare condition, but uh, uh, generally what we see are tears of the bicep tendon with distal retraction. That's what you call it if you have a defined intertuberous groove. If there's no biceps and no intertuberous groove, then it can be the rare situation of a congenital absence. Okay, uh, Ashu, what do you think of this case? Um, so this is a 27-year-old female uh, professional volleyball player with um, shoulder pain. It looks like there are two long head biceps tendon within the bicep of the roof. What, what are these things here? Oh, they look, I, I'm not quite sure. They, they're elongated, they're low signal intensity. Oh, vinicula, okay. So those are called the vincula. Uh, all the tendons uh, have them here, but we usually can't see it. But it's a, it's a fibrous connection to the to the uh, synovium here, and it's a way of uh, also nutrition supply to, to the biceps tendon. Uh, but we see two biceps tendons here with two vincula. Yeah. Usually, usually they're too thin to see on the MR. Right. Yeah. And this is a congenitally bifid biceps. And uh, again, if you have a tear, one, you tend to get irregularity and you get more of a flat, irregular surface between the two tendons where it's torn. These are nice and rounded and sharp. And if you have two vincula, that lets you know that this was congenital. Uh, if you have a tear, you're not going to have two vincula. Not a common finding. Where did they split, John? Uh, I think this this would split all the way down to the musculotendinous junction, and one up to and and, uh, and starts at the uh, origin. The biceps anchor. In the insertion. Yeah. Okay. I've never seen a case, so I haven't been terribly interested in it. Yeah, they're very rare. Okay. Okay. Here's a 43-year-old male with shoulder pain. What do you think of this one? Okay. All right, so we have some axial views through the shoulder. Going superior to inferiorly. Yeah, I don't see that long head biceps tending, connecting over very well. I think what this is is a complete tear of the long head biceps tendon with the intraarticular part of the interarticular portion and part of the tendon remaining in the bicipital groove, but I don't see them connecting. Uh, here, we should have a few more. If you actually follow this all the way back, you would see that this, this uh, tendon actually goes back over to the, uh, it's, the, well, this is an anteriorly dislocated biceps tendon here. And uh, this over here is a little superficial tendon that you commonly see if you really look for it. It's called the accessory head of the biceps. So that's a normal variant. Most people have it, though often it's very small and you just don't notice it. So uh, th this was a dislocated long head of the biceps, and we'll talk about different types of dislocations later in this lecture. And this isn't the biceps tendon. It's not a longitudinal split tear. This is the normal accessory head of the biceps brachii. This doesn't go to the glenoid. This attaches to the humeral head. So here's the, ex the, the accessory head. It comes up here, doesn't follow the long head into the joint space, but attaches to the greater tuberosity. And it's seen somewhere between 9 and 20% more in Asians and less in whites. And that just kind of shows example. Here are just uh, some examples. I won't go through this, but it just uh, histologically, you, you can see that too, separate. Okay, uh, Ashley, what do you think of this case? Uh, um, looks like 
Um, are we looking at the coronal images? Right shoulder pain after a fall two months ago. Um, I think we're following the biceps, long head biceps tendon here. It looks like it's subluxed medially right there, yeah. And I don't know if it's torn. There are the axial images. Okay. Well, would there be any reason why you wouldn't know if it's torn? No, I just, I meant uh, if there was a tear um, and it was just like, because I see, I see, a, I think that's, is that an accessory? Uh, Over here? Yeah. I'm not a radiologist. Uh, it looks like it's, it looks like a the subscap torn? Well, the subscap looks torn. <laughs> the subscap is torn. Right. Okay. So th that, what that is, uh, here, let's, let me go back through. So it gets a little confusing here. This really looks like it's a long head of the biceps. It's sublux uh, medially. What this is, here's the long head of the biceps, which is normally positioned in the intertuberous groove. This is actually a torn subscap, which is retracted. And this thing here is not a dislocated long head of the biceps. That happens to be an accessory short head coming, uh, oh shoot, uh, which it actually, if we follow it up over here, it actually comes from the short head and instead of attaching to the core cord, attaches to the, to the glenoid. So that's another very rare congenital variant uh, that we see here looking like a long head of the biceps tendon because we have a torn and retracted subscapularis tendon. So it's a, another rare congenital variant that can be Might as well show all the stuff you see every day at the beginning of the lecture. Okay. Uh, so here, uh, again, we can see two structures in the intertuberous groove. I uh, have to think about uh, you know, congenital bifid is so rare that I usually don't think about that, uh, you know, even though it looks like smooth margins between the two. Uh, the smaller one is anteriorly placed with respect to the larger one, which makes me think an accessory uh, biceps or brachii in this particular case, so you have to follow where the two go. And, uh, and this, this is one that's called uh, uh, aponeurotic expansion of the supraspinatus tendon, which comes around uh, also in that area. Uh, let's don't go through it here, but basically it's focal thickening here, the transverse ligament, which comes across. So the bottom line is if you can follow it, distally, so it's a linear structure that comes up and attaches to the humerus, it's an accessory brachii. If it's focal thickening of the transverse ligament, uh, then it's just, uh, uh, I just call it that. I just call it focal thickening, but you can uh, call it an aponeurotic expansion if you want to use a fancy word in the literature. But it can also, there it is right there. Let's go back here. So this looks like a long head of the biceps distally here. Now we're getting what looks like two structures, but we didn't see that farther distally. And coming up here, and there you can see that. And that's just a little bit of thickening of that aponeurotic expansion. And then it goes on. So that's, okay. Uh, Let's see, I will remember his next. Jennifer, why do you think it is? Okay, so it looks like, I can't tell if we're going through the long head biceps tendon or the supraspinatus here. Um, supraspinatus, so. Okay. Yeah, so there are some traction changes at the supraspinatus attachment, and it looks like some moderate partial thickness articular surface tearing. Um, and then long head so, bite. So here's like this then is going to turn out to be a split in the biceps, okay. which you can see coming in through here arthroscopically. Mm -hmm. Adheses to the subscapularis tendon. So this is a longitudinal split tear of the biceps. Okay. 
and there's uh, a lot of different variations of the anatomy, which can be subtle. They're, they're more important arthroscopically and less really visualized well by MR. Okay, uh, Ashu, what do you think of this case? We're looking at the long head biceps tendon within the interdipicular root. It looks kind of frayed, and there's some signal abnormality there. Um, there might be an early split tear occurring there. Yep, good. Um, and here, here, this is the biceps tendon over here coming down through. Uh, could it be just the degeneration? Yeah, I, I think these longitudinal split tears are, John, are a form of degenerative disease of the uh, biceps, I think first it kind of breaks down into degenerative disease, and once the degenerative disease gets bad enough, it can actually produce breakdown and cause a split tear. Yeah, they're very common over the age of 45 for their mouths. Good, thank you. Okay, and here we can also see uh, a lot of tendinosis and signal changes within the supraspinatus, and maybe some increased signal changes and a little bit of longitudinal signal within the biceps here coming across there. There's the biceps here. If we follow it up, we're starting to see indistinct margins and increased signal intensity. And then once we start getting into articularly here, we see a lot of increased signal intensity, loss of visualization of parts of the margin becomes really indistinct. And this is bicep tendinosis. This, as you all know, is very common. Uh, and here, this is a lot of increased signal intensity within the tendon, which should be black here. So I just call this interarticular biceps tendinosis. Uh, we should never forget that the shoulder is very complicated. <laughs> yeah, right. And uh, so this is a, a very common cause. And may, most people believe this can be very symptomatic. It often has to be treated by tenodesis of the tendon. And I think I, I already told uh, it's a little different disease than this. Uh, and, and, well, we're going to talk about treatment later right John? right yep yeah okay so i won't say the word actually go ahead go ahead and say it okay so looking further at the anatomy let's go into the bicep sling which i think what john was uh, bringing up a little bit earlier uh, so if we look at the anatomy here's the ac joint up here supraspinated tendon uh, uh, corical humeral ligament coming through here, uh, the transverse ligament going across here. Here's the greater tuberosity, lesser tuberosity, long head of the biceps. And here's the short head of the biceps coming anterior to the subscap attaching to the coracoid process. So this is the basic anatomy superficially here. And here we can see this. And this is the long head of the biceps here. And that's that transverse ligament uh, at Gross where they're putting the forceps in along where the uh, long head of biceps goes. If you uh, start retracting some of the superficial things, you can see the corcohumeral ligament. That's this structure right in through here. It's deep to the supraspinatus tendon, attaches to the coracoid process up here, and then down here to the to the uh, uh, humeral head over over here, and a little bit onto the transverse. Uh, ligament in this location. So this is underneath the subscapularis, and so that's the corcohumeral ligament, and the long head of the biceps tendon goes deep to that. Uh, if we look further here, we can see here is the long head of the biceps tendon. Here is the transverse ligament, part of the corcohumeral ligament, uh, right through there, uh, which we can see in here. And here's the long head of the biceps tendon. This is the corcohumeral ligament, which is obscuring the long head of the biceps tendon in this projection. But deep to this, we'll have the, the superior glenohumeral ligament coming along here and the interarticular portions of the long head of the biceps tendon here. The superior glenohumeral ligament up here is located anteriorly and inferiorly. Well, here it's just straight anteriorly to the long head of the biceps, and then it comes underneath it uh, along over here, which we'll talk about. Uh, if we look at this anatomy in the sagittal plane, uh, we can see there's the biceps tendon there. The corcohumeral ligament would be above that. Then there's the supraspinatus tendon up, up there. And here we can see this kind of anatomy on gross specimen as well. 
Another way to look at this, uh, uh, here's the transverse ligament, long head of the biceps coming in through here, uh, corcohumeral ligament, superficial, above the long head of the biceps tendon. If we look underneath this, here's the corcohumeral ligament above the biceps tendon here, attaching to the glenoid over there. Uh, and then the coracoid process over in this area, biceps tendon attaching to the uh, here to the superior glenoid. And then notice the superior glenohumeral ligament starts anterior to the biceps tendon where it attaches to the glenoid, then comes underneath the biceps tendon, uh, and then it comes over and attaches to the to the humerus. And this is the sling. So if the biceps tries to start subluxing anteriorly, the uh, superior glenohumeral ligament will keep it from doing that if you have the normal anatomy. And this just shows uh, uh, kind of how the two are next to each other. Corcohumeral ligament, lung head of the biceps tendon. Corcohumeral ligament is there. Biceps tendon is, is here, and we can see the joint fluid around it. And then, well, same thing. So here, let's look. So sling anatomy. Here's the sagittal images. Corcohumeral ligament is coming across there, and it's going to go across superiorly. Here's the tubercle where the biceps tendon and search, lung head of the biceps tendon and search, part of the superior labrum in this location. Go out a little bit more, corcohumeral ligament above the biceps tendon, superior glenohumeral ligament is anteriorly and now it's coming inferior to the tendon. So this is the sling, right? Here's the sling, which helps hold the biceps tendon in place and keeps it from subluxing anteriorly. And then if you go farther, we're now beyond the superior glenohumeral ligament, and now we just have the biceps tendon, and now it's on its way to the inner tuberous groove, where it will then go into the groove and then go down into the arm distally. Again, here's the corcohumeral ligament, which is that flat uh, fibrous sheet above the uh, biceps tendon. Here's another example showing the superior glenohumeral ligament, uh, biceps tendon, corcohumeral ligament above it here, and this is the sling mechanism that you can see best on the sagittal images. And that's the corcohumeral ligament biceps. And this is someone where actually, well, we'll talk about you can get tears in the superior glenohumeral ligament and anterior subluxation of the biceps tendon. And we'll talk about that. Here we actually have a tear of the superior glenohumeral ligament, corcohumeral ligament up here, and the biceps tendon is starting to sublux anteriorly uh, through the area of the tear. So uh, so you can get tears uh, either at the humeral attachment of the superior glenohumeral ligament or at uh, uh, more proximally, or you can get tears of the corcohumeral ligament up here. Uh, any of those can then uh, lead to uh, a lack of stabilization of the long head of the biceps tendon and anterior subluxation of the biceps tendon. So let's talk about biceps instability. This was a grading system that, that I kind of used in the 1990s uh, before there were some other publications uh, about this uh, uh, and just from our what we saw over the years looking at these uh, grade one could be a sling injury but no displacement a uh, grade one would be a perched biceps tendon grade two is displaced into the subscapularis tendon grade three is displaced into the joint space grade four is displaced anterior to the subscap five is uh, dislocated of biceps with subscapularis rupture. Six is posterior dislocation of the biceps, which is very rare, and then a complete biceps rupture. Uh, so uh, uh, we kind of defined this system when I was in Santa Barbara back in the mid-1990s. Since then, uh, Bennett and some other people have come up with uh, uh, other uh, similar type grading systems, uh, but but not as as complex. Another grading system that a lot of orthopedic surgeons like to use is the Habermeyer system, which was in 2004. Type 1 is uh, perched biceps where you have a superior glenohumeral ligament tear. Type 2 is uh, where you have both a superior glenohumeral ligament and supraspinatus tears both. Type 3, uh, superior, superior glenohumeral ligament with a subscapularis tear. And 4 is a superior glenohumeral ligament tear with both uh, supraspinatus and subscapularis tears. 
So basically, these are the structures you're looking for uh, when uh, when you see bicep sensitivity. Yeah, my understanding is that the supraspinatus tendon um, and also uh, subscapularis uh, tendons, um, their fibers uh, do connect uh, in a in a bicepital groove. Yes. Uh, superior, yes. Superiorly, yes. And, and it becomes a little confusing um, in terms of um, um, the pathology when the generation takes place. Yeah, good. So this is from a paper in Radiographics uh, 2011 uh, showing different locations where you can have tears uh, that then lead to uh, instability of the biceps, and it can involve uh, uh, superior ligament, corcohumeral ligament, uh, supraspinatus, or subscapularis. And uh, and the reason this is important from an arthroscopic class, uh, classification is that if you're thinking of repairing it, then you have to look at the different structures to repair it. In practice, most of the time I'm aware of, if, if people believe that there's a significant uh, pain from biceps instability, most people will either release the biceps, uh, but or if they're concerned about the quote, quote Popeye deformity, though it's upper arm, not lower arm, uh, then they'll do a biceps tenodesis uh, rather than trying to do a completely anatomic repair of these structures. John, do you want to comment on that? Um, it um, a lot depends on age, and um, um, what the best result actually is is tenotomy, um, which which is uh, recommended uh, more in the fifties and sixties yeah. or over, um, and 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 usually the patients uh, do their own tenotomies by a rupture. Yeah, and uh, and within a couple of weeks they don't have any more pain. Uh, they may not have um five percent of the function that they had before, but uh, overall uh, the pain is gone. But but it may uh, take years before they tear the biceps. Pardon me. It may take years of pain before they actually tear the biceps. And uh, they they don't have pain very long. Okay. Uh, the patients I've had, uh, their pain goes away pretty quickly. Well, uh, what they do have is that uh, um, Miss uh, Nomard um, uh, Popeye sign, uh, but that also goes away when the atrophy takes place and you don't see it anymore. That's after the tear, but yeah, but it takes years. To actually develop the, the actual tear itself. So oh yeah, I'm well, sure because there's a degeneration and then and then there are various treatments depending on the age yeah. uh, in terms of tenotomy and what part of the biceps you you tenodese yeah. uh, in, in a groove. Um, mo most of the tenodeses are done in a groove, um, and 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 usually you, you use. Um, um, <clears throat> two devices. Um, uh, <clears throat> it, it, it can be a, um, a screw, which is the most common, uh, and um, or or a, a, a suture. Suture uh, uh, <clears throat> anchor. Yeah, anchor. I'm sorry, I'm, all of a sudden my throat is all <coughs> tea time. Uh, I've, I've taken care or been involved with the care of a number of athletes. Uh, one in particular was a well-known quarterback uh, who uh, actually was won the Super Bowl three times. And the last three years that he played in the NFL, he had severe shoulder pain that he kept complaining and being seen about. Uh, and what it was was uh, subluxation of the biceps tendon, and I'll show you some examples in just a minute. But uh, when he was getting ready for his last Super Bowl, he heard, felt a pop in his shoulder, 
It hurt for about five or ten minutes. Then the pain that he had had for the last three years went away, and he won the Super Bowl. And he came back furious at his orthopedic surgeon who told him what happened, and I asked him why he didn't cut the damn tendon years ago rather than having him go through three years of agony. So, so these can be painful. So what do these things look like? Actually, the biceps area is extremely sensitive. And uh, when you examine a shoulder, even with the problem of this supraspinatus and the rotator cuff area, the biceps is still the far more tender um, s structure, even if there is not involved in any kind of um, um, swelling and or inflammation. It's sensitive just to the touch. Good. So even we have a normal, and it's one of the easiest ones uh, to, to to diagnose uh, if you know what you're doing, of course. Okay. So let me show some examples now. So here is an early grade lesion where we get a little bit of a partial tear of the subscapularis, which you see all the time. The superior fibers in this location is a common location uh, for uh, partial tears of the rotator cuff. Here's the biceps tendon. Sorry about the motion artifact here. Uh, but we can see the little subscapular. It's minimally displaced and flattened within the groove. If we go to the sagittal images, what you can see is an abnormal signal intensity within the superior glenohumeral ligament. The corcohumeral ligament is intact. Superior glenohumeral ligament is injured. And this would be uh, our kind of grade zero, no displacement at this time. But probably what's happening here is that at the time of the MR scan, it's not displaced. But during function, uh, the, the biceps tendon has been subluxing out into the subscap tendon which is the cause of the partial tear here. And that's when it becomes painful. And then this would be a Habermeyer 3 because it's associated with a subscapularis tear. So uh, uh, now let me just go back here for a second. For years, this lesion in the orthopedic literature was called the hidden lesion. You can't see it by x-rays. You can't see it by arthrography because uh, the deep fibers are intact here. You can't see it arthroscopically either. So it would have to be based kind of on, uh, on clinical examination. And therefore, it was kind of hidden to more objective findings. And that's why for years it was called the hidden lesion. When MR came along, we were able to directly diagnose this condition, uh, which was uh, significantly beneficial in evaluating anterior shoulder pain. And that's why this uh, understanding of the biceps tendon is really important because now this is a clinical, but it's really a, a MR diagnosis. Okay. So just a quick question then. The, the, the order of injury goes superior glenohumeral ligament, then medial subluxation of the biceps, then tear of the subscap? No, it doesn't. Uh, the Habermeyer classification this isn't sequential. This is just uh, uh, his classification based upon anatomic findings. Uh, generally, uh, what happens in my experience, usually the first thing to go is the superior glenohumeral ligament. Uh, then you start getting anterior subluxation, subluxation uh, the long head of the biceps, which then uh, goes into the subscapularis, producing the subscapularis tear. And uh, the supraspinatus uh, tear is less common because most of the forces on the biceps tendon are anteriorly, not posteriorly. So, uh, and I, I believe most of the supraspinatus injuries in this location are actually tears of the supraspinatus tendon anteriorly rather than due to subluxation of the biceps, but it allows the biceps to sublux there. Remember, this anterior insertional tears of the supraspinatus are the most common location for tears by, by MR as opposed to what's been published in some of the literature. Okay. Uh, that's the new Campbell's. Oh, good. Yeah, we've been saying that ever since. That, that thing about uh, the classification, um, I, I've never used it. I don't know whether there was a radiologist that came up with it, or it probably was, because uh, not the, I, not the, yeah. I, I, the only place I heard it, John, is in your lectures. 
Yeah, I've given a lecture about this ever since about 1989 or 90, and it's in some of the books. Uh, that's about when I met you, I think. Right, exactly, that's right. Uh, Maybe 86. Again, the actual grading system isn't really what's important. The importance is to understand the pathophysiology and the anatomic findings and what are important, so you describe those in, in, your, in your report. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, Jennifer, what do you think of this case? So here I see thickening and increased signal intensity within the subscapularis tendon. Um, looks like subscapularis tendinosis. The long head biceps tendon is there in the intertubercular groove, and I don't see any significant flattening or subluxation. Well, uh, uh, there is some something going on in that groove, isn't there? It's uh, it's just not some fluid around there. This it's kind of mushy looking. Small amount of soft tissue thickening. Yeah, yeah right. That is so so it is a degenerative condition of some sort. But at this time, he actually had a small supraspinatus tear, but the biceps there was no evidence of uh, clinical biceps disease. Uh, then it came back six years later, and this is what it looked like. Okay. So now here we can see some medial subluxation of the long head biceps tendon into the subscapularis, and we can see that there's some partial thickness, interstitial tearing of the subscapularis tendon. Um, That's actually one of these. Uh, this is what it looked like when it was asymptomatic, and this is what it now looks like that it is symptomatic. There have been surgeries uh, advised uh, on biceps tendons uh, where they split the disc uh, longitudinally uh, to repair them, and I frankly think that's kind of silly, but that was done at one time. Okay. Um, and, and and so when you see the, this kind of thing, that you really would recommend that uh, suturing them together. But uh, frankly, that 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 sounds um, something I wouldn't do. Yeah. Okay. So so this would be a type one. This is a perched biceps where we can see some uh, partial tearing of the subs. This would be my type one. Uh, this would be a Habermeyer three. Okay. And this is just an arthrogram showing the same pathology. Notice that you've got deformity of the groove here because you've got a chronic anterior subluxation of the long head of the biceps tendon, which is kind of eroded off part of the uh, anterior uh, intertuberous groove. If you go back here, that's probably been occurring here, uh, uh, a little bit of erosive changes and deformity of the intertuberous groove. And then, and then here we can see the contrast going into the partial tear of the distal subscap there. So this would be another old uh, hidden lesion. Uh, here's a 56-year-old male with worsening chronic anterior shoulder pain. And again, here we can see marked remodeling of the intertuberous groove, uh, where now the bicep tendon is still within the groove, but anteriorly. But we can see the subscapularis fibers are really attaching over here in the groove. So this was probably the original intertuberous groove. And this is kind of erosive changes that have occurred over time uh, due to the uh, chronic anterior subluxation, and again, we have a little subscap partial tear. Uh, the patient also had a rotator cuff tear. So this would be a chronic grade one lesion. Okay, uh, Ashu, what do you think of this one? Here we can see that the biceps tendon is torn, I mean, not torn, I mean, the subscap uh, tendon is torn and the biceps long head tendon is immediately subluxed within the torn subscap. So. Uh, in the early days, what we would see would be uh, dislocations of the biceps anteriorly. When it dislocates anteriorly, 20% of the time it'll go superficial to the uh, subscapularis tendon. 80% of the time it will actually dislocate into the joint space here. So we were faced with the dilemma about 1989 uh, of you have an anterior dislocated biceps, but it's in the joint space between where it is in the joint space and in the intertuberous groove is the entire thick subscapularis tendon. So the question was, how did the biceps get from external to the bicep, to the subscap insertion into the joint space? And then we saw this case uh, after 
scratching our heads for a couple of years. Uh, and then it all dawned on us that what happened is you have these partial tears of the deep fibers of the subscap. The superficial fibers usually stay intact. The biceps tendon subluxes anteriorly, then tears through the deep fibers and ends up in the joint space. And here we caught it in that transition phase where it's inside the fibers uh, in this location. So uh, this called grade two. This again would be a Habermeyer three. Guy, would, a guy must have a high pain threshold. Yeah, well, he was pain. He was in pain. But again, this was really in the early days when our confidence is MR. We were just starting out doing MRs of the shoulder. Uh, and, and this was, to my knowledge at that particular time, not yet described in the medical literature. Uh, but people had to know it occurred because people did know that it would dislocate into the joint space. But uh, uh, in retrospect, it was obvious, but in prospect, it wasn't so obvious. So this would be what we call a grade two. Habermeyer would still call this a grade three. And then here we have a dislocation of the biceps tendon. It's not in the intertuberous groove, and now it's in the joint space. And here we can see the subscapularis tendon attached. But notice, and we just said the subscap was intact, but now understanding the pathophysiology, what's happened is the biceps tendon has been pulled anteriorly, uh, went along the edge of the bone that's contained it here, then it was pulled back through the deep fibers. The superficial fibers are still intact, but the subscapularis may be intact, but it's a high-grade partial tear because greater than 50% of the thickness of the tendon has been torn here. And the tendon has now ended up into the joint space. We call this uh, a type 3, uh, uh, and this is an interarticular biceps dislocation which is a fairly common finding uh, in people at this age. We see this much more commonly than we see the tendon inside the subscapularis uh, muscle. Yeah, it, 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 what, what we would do surgically is uh, put it back in the groove, and if it's um, um, not uh, too frayed, uh, more, not more than 50%, we, we would tenodice it um, okay. in, in the groove. If not, uh, depending on age, we 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 would um, uh, do a tenotomy. In other words, uh, just uh, Cut it. Uh, slice it and let it fly. Okay, great. And then here is another dislocation. Here, however, the tendon is staying superficial to the subscapularis tendon. Here it's coming over the top, and this we called the type four extraarticular dislocation. Did he mention the supraspinatus, John? Did, who's mentioned? Habermeyer. Yes, that's that's his grade two is a supraspinatus tear. Okay. Okay. Uh, and then here we can see a 58 year old female, and here we can see another superficial dislocation of the long head of the biceps tendon, empty inner tuberous groove, and the medial dislocation of the biceps superficial to the subscap. Though there's a lot. Uh, this is actually some extravasation of contrast from an arthrogram. I really don't like doing arthrograms here. If you're concerned at all about anterior shoulder pain, unless I guess you're really concerned that it's, unless you know that it's going to be a labrum, I don't like to inject in this particular area because it distorts the anatomy and it doesn't allow us to adequately evaluate uh, the subscapularis tendon. And uh, so we call this a type four. Uh, we already talked about and surgery uh, surgically we don't like to play with that either because you don't want to uh, disrupt the uh, subscap yeah um, which which is uh, a necessary tendon for function yeah good uh see so who's next jennifer i think what did you So here it looks like there's two separate tendons, and at least one of them may have a vincula. So I think these are separate long head and short head of the. Short oh, this is the bifid long head tendon. Right? Yeah, so the yeah, the rare case. You can generally bifid long head the biceps tendon with. Oops. So there's a, uh, remember that these can be split. Yeah, but, but this this had two. So, so this was a congenital bifid 
where one of the tendons was subluxing anteriorly, causing pain. And, and they can split down um, due to degenerative change too. Right, that's right. Which is probably more common than what you see um, by fit. Much more common, exactly. And they're the two coming out here. Okay, uh, uh, and here we can see a complete tear of the subscapularis tendon with dislocation of the biceps and to the interarticular groove. So that's a complete subscap tear biceps, and this would be a Habermeyer Meyer 4, and we called it a top 5. And here's an 81-year-old female, and here we can just see there's a long head of the biceps dislocated into the, into the joint space with a disrupted, completely torn subscap. Again, uh, our type 5, Habermeyer type 4. Uh, let's see, Ashu, what do you think of this case? So a 28-year-old male with shoulder pain after a motorcycle accident. I think you can see, I see something in the superiorly there, right? I, I, I think it's... Okay, let's follow this up. So now we're in the metaphysis of the humerus. If we go okay. approximately, there it is. There it is as we're getting... Wow, it's posteriorly dislocated. And there it's coming That's right. Crazy. That's crazy. Okay, so this is a very rare condition. And that, 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 that gives you a, a good idea not to not to be on that but that motorcycle. Yeah, exactly. I, I learned my lesson the hard way also. Uh, those are dangerous vehicles. Uh, so this is a very rare posterior dislocation. When Rick Ariga first saw this case and showed it to me, I think there were only about three reported in the literature. So it, it's very rare, but we call this a grade six. Did, did, did he have any nerve injuries that you know of, John? I don't know. I don't know anything clinically about this patient at all. Okay. Okay, and then you can have a complete disruption of the biceps with distal location, as we see here. And here we can see a complete tear of the, of the uh, this patient actually had tears of both, or I mean, a complete tear of the lung of the biceps with distal retraction. Well, very active and active individuals. And we called that a time seven. So, uh, let's see, uh, Jennifer, what do you think of this case? Okay. Here again, I see absence of the long head biceps tendon within the bicepital groove, and it looks like it's retracted there along the mid humerus. And I see diffuse increased signal in the muscle. Yeah, that's hematoma. There are a lot of hemorrhage, and this was a big hematoma associated there. I don't see this very often, but it's something you have to look for when you see acute tears. And there again, we can see a rupture. Here, here is one where it actually tore not at the at the attachment to the superior glenoid, but uh, in the interarticular portion. So we can see a remnant of the tendon here at the biceps anchor. The tear was here, and then it distally retracted. That's pretty uncommon as well. Okay, and then here you can see, here's another patient with a, a, a tear here, a lot of tendinosis of the uh, uh, biceps tendon uh, near its attachment to the glenoid, markedly thick in there, uh, and uh, with a lot of mass effect within the joint space, and uh, obviously absence of the biceps in the groove. But, but these can actually produce mechanical symptoms within the shoulder, so you have to make sure the surgeon's aware of that, and if that's a condition, this might have to be resected. Okay, okay here's another empty intertuberous groove here with a, just the accessory tendon uh, intact there coming up through here, and here we can see uh, a remnant of the biceps tendon attached to the biceps anchor up higher, and here it's coming down here. So that was a big stuff, which was producing a lot of mechan mechanical problems within the joint space, and they had to go in and resect this, uh, and then they just left it to float. One thing to remember, uh, that that's the, um, just about the only area in the shoulder that you can actually um, 
feel the biceps tendon and and, and um, any anatomy in that region uh, of the shoulder. Uh, the rest of the shoulder is not, uh, you can't feel things. Good. Uh, and then, as you all know, you can look at the rotator cuff interval here, and this is a lot of scarring in the rotator cuff interval, which can adhere to the biceps tendon and be part of the pain syndrome of uh, a frozen shoulder in that location. And that barrier, barrier area fills with uh, loose as a fat, doesn't it, John? And yes. Yeah. Frozen, frozen shoulder. Yeah, we've the fellows have seen a lot of those already this year. And here, as far as treatment goes, here's a place where you have a, a biotinodesis screw right at the inner tuberous groove, and this was a, a tenodesis of the biceps tendon. And you try to look at it in the sagittal plane, you can see the tendon coming up into where it's tenodesed to the bone here, and then. And then more more approximately, we did not see the tendon in the joint space. So that's a typical tenodesis. Uh, uh, early on, these were usually done open. Uh, now the majority of these I've seen over the last few years have all did, been done arthroscopically. And here's another tenodesis. And if you go in the oblique plane, we can see the tendon coming up here, the tenodesis screw, and there's the tenodesis in the neck of the humerus. Okay. Uh, Ashley, what do you think of this case? So we're looking at the intertubricular groove. I think there's, there's low intensity structure, low signal structure seen there, um, kind of lateral to the long head biceps tendon. I kind of would want to follow that. A 77 year old middle shoulder pain. Um, it almost looks like a an, like a loose body yeah. sitting there. So you can get loose bodies, and they uh, not, this is a fairly common location for loose bodies in the joint space too, and you have to be careful not to miss them. Good. Okay, uh, Jennifer. I don't see anything on the radiographs. Here we can see the long head biceps tendon coming up. There's some heterogeneous signal intensity. I'm not sure if that's within the sheath or not. Okay, so here we can see some heterogeneous signal intensity in the long head biceps. I'm not sure if this is tenosynovitis, if it's debris, it could be loose bodies, chondromatosis. So all the, remember this is part of the intraarticular space, this is synovium, so all the synovial diseases like synovial chondromatosis you can see in the biceps tendon sheath. Here's another example of synovial chondromatosis of the biceps tendon sheath. All these little I, I have a question um, for the young lady. Um, how many are, how many articulations are there in the shoulder? The forequarter, the shoulder, um, um, as is. I do not know. Three. Only, only, only four. Four. Mm hmm. Sternoclavicular, and then, and then, then a humeral, and, uh, and then the, uh, and then clavicular, uh, clavicular, uh, chromial, and then uh, glenohumeral, humeral, and, and then scapulothoracic. And then here's just an over. That's something that we keep forgetting, um, and that's really what your shoulder is. Okay, good, right. Uh, so here's a case where we can see that there's what looks like this big cyst here in the uh, inner tuberous groove. And we can follow it here, and what we see is a lot of fluid uh, tracking down through here. Uh, and then this is actually the biceps tendon. 
and this is an intratendinous ganglion cyst within the biceps tendon. Uh, and then here, you can see another big cyst within the biceps tendon here. And these are really partial tears that kind of fill with fluid, intratendinous ganglion. There's a patient who had chest pain, ruli pectoralis tendon tear. Uh, the tendon is right here. And this is the pectoralis, the uh, musculotendinous junction, and then you've got a thin tendon. This tendon is up and down. It measures about three to four centimeters, but it's very thin where it attaches. Uh, and it goes over the long head of the biceps tendon or anterior to it. Uh, in this case, this is a T1-weighted image. The PD facet, we see a big tear here. And pectoralis tendon uh, muscle tears are fairly common in weightlifters. And the, the big thing to determine is where the tear is. If the tear primarily involves the muscle or the musculotendinous junction, then it's treated conservatively because you can't sew in the muscle. And so when these patients go to MR, that's what the surgeon wants to know. Is this involve the muscle, in which case it's non-surgical, or does it just involve the, the tendon uh, or the tendon bone interface, in which case it is surgical? So here's another example. Also, and here anteriorly, big big weightlifter, uh, sagittal images. We can see here. This is the distal end of the of the pectoralis. There's the tendon coming off of that right there, and this should go and attach to the bone. Well, you could ask for an implant, John. Okay, right. Uh, and so here on the axial images, here's the distal end of the pectoralis. The tendon should be a nice thin tendon. It should go anterior to the biceps and attached to the humeral head over here. This one's obviously been torn off the bone and retracted back, so this is a surgical case. So that's what the surgeon wants to know. Here, here's a, here, let's see, uh, Jennifer, what do you think of this case? All right, so you can see some edema there along the pectoralis major muscle and I can't make out that tendon connecting very well to the humeral head. There's the tendon insertion. Uh, there's a tear just beyond that. So I would think this would be surgical. How would you connect it to the muscle? I do not know. No, if it was uh, a pulse from the bone, it would be surgical. The fact that that's evolved from the muscle, it's not. So, so this is a tear right at the musculotendinous junction, and again, you can't really sew in the muscle. So these are typically treated conservatively. Uh, right. Thanks, John. Okay. Just it just won't hold sutures. <clears throat> so here's a 24-year-old weightlifter with recurrent chest wall pain. What we see here on the Coronal T1-weighted images is some fat in the area of the distal musculotendinous junction of the, uh, of the pectoralis, but there is some fluid here that's dark on the T1-weighted image and some fluid here as well on the T2 fat, and there's the, the fluid. And then we can see that there's a, a lot of fluid collection here on the sagittal T2-weighted sequence. Uh, and then on the PD fat set, we can see the, the fluid right in through here as well. So this was a patient, and, but you can see asymmetry here. That's right. The other thing, you, we usually don't get a large field of view like this to see both sides, but you do still need to look to see if you have this kind of truncation of the lateral margin of the pectoralis, that means that you've had retraction. And this particular patient, he had prior tears. They were treated conservatively, and he healed with this retracted nature, and then he got a superimposed acute injury on top of chronic and that fat was the chronic, and there was a little bit of nub of the tendon, but we can see we don't see any tendon coming off that muscle, and uh, therefore uh, it, it was non-surgical. And then I think this is our last case today, 64-year-old female, anterior shoulder pain. Uh, what do you think of this one? Uh, Ashu. you. Well, it looks like there's severe tendinosis of the subscap with interstitial tearing. And I think the long head biceps tendon is also kind of immediately subluxed um, within that so torn the, subscap. So the subscap is torn. Uh, the area that they're concerned about is what's happening up there. Oh, is that fluid at the uh, short head? Here, if we go on the sagittal images, we can see this is the area of the fluid up here. Mm -hmm. 
and this is the pectoralis minor tendon, and this was a, a partial tear, actually, of the pectoralis minor tendon there, and a full thickness tear of the subscapularis. But, but uh, the pectoralis minor comes up in, in this location, and uh, that's what a partial tear looks like with fluid around it. Okay, any questions? All right, then uh, next week we'll move on to other topics. Thanks, everybody. Have a great